Well, here we are, ready for uh, chapters seven and maybe eight. We'll see how that goes. I think it's uh, checking the weather. It's a good day for reading. So, with that said, the scene is a little young, but we will go if I don't get sick. Chapter seven. It was not possible to think at first. He turned back to the cabin, moving bent over like an old man, holding his sore arm and shoulder, and he simply could not think. It was enough for him, enough for the movement to feel the warmth of the sun, smell the sea, see the sky, blue light. He'd been certain he was dead, and suddenly there was a blue light all around him, and he could not make himself think of what to do. He was alone. That was it. He was alone and the frog was full of water and he was thirsty and hungry. It all rushed in again and again and he had to fight the terror of it. What he wanted to do most of all was panic, to scream and panic and then look up and see rescue boats or a, or a chopper and, and know that this was all over. But that didn't happen. Alone, he was alone and he had to stop thinking before there was panic and it blew up on him, and he lost control. First things first, he had to pick one thing, and he had to work on it, the storm. He knew about that. The storm had taken him, taken the boat in its fist and, and blown it. Where? How far? He frowned, thinking. The storm had, had, had lasted how long? A day? No, 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 more than that. There'd been that time in the darkness, the, the madness and the darkness, the crash and darkness. So, so it had to be most of one day and, and through the night. And he thought, into the next morning, 20, perhaps 24 hours. And how fast had the sea been taking him? No way to know. His head hurt to think about it. Okay, say five knots, maybe a bit more, maybe, maybe six knots, about seven and a half miles an hour. It's too complicated. Make it eight miles an hour. The storm had been pushing him south and west at eight miles an hour for probably 24 hours. 192 miles. 192 miles. But that wasn't the all of it. He had sailed 12 hours at almost 10 miles an hour before that in the same direction, south and west. There was another 120 miles. So say 350 miles at least south west of the California coast where he sat right now, rolling heavily in a boat half full of water. And you say not to panic, a small voice told him. Why not panic? You're alone 300 plus miles at sea in a small boat. You deserve to panic. Go ahead, go ahead and panic. That was wrong thinking. He shook his head, nearly screamed at the pain it caused him, and leaned against the cabin opening. There were more demanding problems to figuring out where he was or for how long it took him to get there. The frog was in trouble, still in bad trouble, even though the storm was gone. She could only have four or five inches of freeboard left in the sides, and at least, and at, at the least feeling, her deck would go under from the weight of the water inside the boat. If that happened, she'd go down like a rock. And I'd be floating alone 315 miles from the shore in a life jet. He had to pin things down and start somewhere. First, a drink. His mouth was so dry and clammy, his lips almost stuck together when he closed them. He moved gingerly down into the cabin. Standing once more in the water, he picked up a plastic cup floating in the garbage near the sail. He was amazed to find that the hand pump on the sink still worked. Although, to be realistic, nothing should have been broken. He pumped his glass four or five times and drank the water from the fresh water tank under the front bunk. It tasted slightly brackish and a fiberglass, but it was sweet to it anyway, and it didn't much and it did much to cheer him until he thought of the water tank. He could not remember first how large it was, and he didn't even know if it was full. Owen had told him once, once it was 20 gallons, 22. Is that it? He'd have to check it and see how full it was because he didn't know how soon he'd get water because he didn't know how far he was really from shore and he was alone and couldn't expect help. And if he ran out of water, 
and he starts to drink seawater. He'd read stories about people who drank seawater going insane and dying horrible deaths. All right, he stopped thinking again. The panic was right there on the edge, waiting to blow everything up if he would let it. I've got to do this thing one step at a time, he said out loud. There has to be an order to this. One hand for the ship, the phrase suddenly jumped into his mind. In the old sailing days of the clipper ships and square riggers and sailors had to climb up the rigging and hang on the wooden yard, swinging wildly many feet above the deck while they worked at getting the sails squared away. New men, especially, had a hard time of it, and it would frankly get out in the yard and look down and freeze in terror, grabbing the yard or sail rope and just hang on for dear life. And to be sure, many of those old time settlers fell to their death. But for others, a mate down below would yell up, one hand for the sailor and one hand for the ship. It meant, of course, that the sailor should let go with one hand and overcome his fear to get the sails working. The words applied now, one hand for the ship. The most important thing right now wasn't his fear, it wasn't his location or how much water or food he had, it was the frog itself. His whole life depended on the frog, and if he didn't take care of her, give her one hand for the ship, none of the rest of it would likely even matter. She was staggering heavy with water in her. That was the first thing. He had to get the water out and get her back to floating right. Next to the motor in the stern compartment, the lazarette, there was a small hand pump with two hoses attached to it. The idea was you put one hose in the water, inboard water and ran the other hose over the side and worked the plunger handle until the water was gone. He got the pump, was surprised to find the motor still in one piece. Although there was a small dent in the square five gallon can next to it and arranged the hoses, one over the side, one down in the water inside the cabin. He worked the plunger once and about half a cup of water spurted into the ocean. Another pump, another spurt. He hit it six or seven times really fast, but the, the spurts didn't increase, didn't decrease, always half a cup. He sat on a cockpit seat and he settled in for the work. Half a cup, shot, half a cup a shot, and then about eight pumps for a quart of water, 32 pumps to the gallon. He studied the water down inside the cab, and it was impossible to guess how many gallons but he would say at least 100, so that would be 3,200 pumps of the, pump, of the plunger. Pump, squirt, pump, squirt, pump, squirt, pump, squirt. It was gonna be a long day. Chapter eight. There were over 100 gallons in the cabin. He pumped for a time and counted them, figuring that he'd work the pump about 30 times a minute. So 100 minutes, there'd be 3,000 pumps. 100 minutes, and there was still a lot of water in the cabin. The boat didn't even feel much lighter, still lay heavily in the shallow swell. After perhaps four hours, his right arm was aching with the effort. She was at last lightened. The water was shallow puddle in the middle of the cabin floor. Another half hour and the hose was making slurpy noises, and he stopped. The dampness left on the floor would evaporate in the sun's heat. It was evening now. The sun was low over the water. In the entire day, there had not been one breath of wind, and the sails still hung where he had jammed them before the storm. He had to get them up, aired out, and stowed correctly, or at least tied in place, but he found he couldn't move. His left shoulder still hurt, and somehow working the pump with his right arm had, had aggravated the left one as well. His, his head still hurt, hurt, hurt from the boom injury, but it wasn't that so much as just plain exhausted. He felt wrecked. He was floating now. He'd given one hand to the ship, and now he just simply could not move. He sat on the left seat of the cockpit and leaned against the back cabin wall and closed his eyes and sleep took him as if he'd been hit with a soft hammer. Not long, half an hour, perhaps a bit more. He kept looking at his watch once he was conscious, but it was still blank. And he suddenly came awake, like that, as fast as he had gone to sleep. 
and it's cranking his neck and leaning against the cabin side. He stood and stretched. He felt his neck pop a bit and carefully reached, stretched his left arm. It would go shoulder high, but no higher. That would have to do. He stepped up the side rail and moved forward to the mast. The halyards just hung loose, tangled with each other, and loosened jib sheets. Owen would have been furious if he could have seen the mess. And using most of his right arm for the effort of the untangling of the ropes and pulled the mainsail back up, feeding it out of the cabin real gently to keep it from snagging. It was sobbing, but the Dacron wouldn't rot or soak up water and would dry rapidly in the open. There was still was so still that the sail just hung there without even a, a luffing. He had never seen it this cold. Without even the customary soft debris which Owen had told him came in the evening cool and met the day heat and caused air movement. And he cleated the halyard off easily. He went back down in their cabin and opened the front hatch to loosen the pinched jib. It took him several minutes using only his right hand to push the jib back out and into the deck. He pushed it up handful by handful and then it would fall back down on him. And he went topside and he hoisted the jib, which hung as dead as the main. The inside of the boat was still a frightful mess, the garbage and the dampness all around, but the frog was at least a boat again, floating high on the slick palm of the swell, her sails up and drying, one hand for the ship. Thirsty again, it just, thirsty again, it just came that way. He was thirsty and he took another cup full of water from the hand pump in the sink. How could he be thirsty in the middle of a full ocean. His mouth felt as if he'd been in a desert. One cup didn't seem to be enough, so he drank another. Then he remembered that he didn't know how much water there was in the tank. As soon as his thirst was pushed down, the hunger came up. He had not eaten for two days, and his stomach seemed to have turned, into, turned in on itself. In the middle of the cabin floor, rolling back and forth, was a can of bite-sized ravioli. He found the can opener back under the cockpit, jammed up in the corner of the cabin's bunk, captain's bunk. When he figured the angle the in when he figured the angle the boat had to roll and pitch to flip the locked in silverware drawer, tip it up and over, the dump he could open and dump the can opener that far away, the back of his neck stiffened with fear. She must have been well past sideways, heading for a complete rollover. It didn't seem possible for the frog to have gone that far without feeling and sinking. And he was almost glad he'd been unconscious when it had happened. There are some things that's just better not to know, he whispered. Better just to let them be. It took him another minute to find a spoon, knives, forks, and the spoons were scattered all over before he could sit down and eat. Then it was almost a religious experience. He took each bite size ravioli held it in his mouth, chewed slowly and lovingly, sitting in the cockpit. Mm. Then he swallowed it, hesitating a moment before taking another bite. It was the first time in his life he had been really, really hungry. Owen and his parents had spoken of hunger, world hunger, and he had seen shows on television, but he had never really been without food for any length of time, never over a few hours. He found two things happening in this, to this, his thinking. First, he became angry. There was no sense to it, but the hunger made him angry. And though it were some personal attack on him, and the second feeling was that he loved food. Not just liked it, but loved it. It tasted so fine, the little chunky, little ravioli bites tasted so incredibly fine that it made his temples hurt and chewed. He wanted to keep the ravioli forever, keep it and cherish it and eat it all at the same time. He took over an hour to eat just a handful. Around him, the evening came down, the sun seemed to hurl itself from the western sky into the distant sea, the ocean cooling, the air with the sun gone, though still without a wind, until he felt a chill when he went to get his jacket. His eyes kept closing. He sat outside for a while, wishing it were not getting dark. Something about the coming darkness frightened him and his, his eyes kept closing. It's not that I'm tired, he said to himself out loud. I'm not so tired. His eyes kept closing and 
Finally, he leaned against the cabin wall, sitting in the cockpit, and he dozed again. He would have slept except that after a few minutes he became uncomfortable. He went down inside the boat and stretched out on the captain's bunk. The cushion was still sopping wet, but he didn't care any longer and was almost instantly asleep, sure that nothing would awaken him until daylight. His eyes snapped open in the near darkness. The inside of the boat was bathed in a pale white light coming from the moon through the cabin windows and the rear hatch opening. He lay still in the bunk, feeling the frog ride lightly on the waves, listening intently. intently. There was silence, complete and utter silence. Not even the sound of the water working against the sides of the boat. Stone silence. In the moonlight and no reason that he should have sprung awake that way he did. For a time, his eyes were wide open and he listened with a, his breath held. But when he saw nothing, he heard nothing, he felt nothing, he closed his eyes and started to drift back to sleep. He would have gone under again, except just that his brain began to shut down, the world exploded. There was a horrible scraping sound, like somebody dragging a claw down the whole length of the boat, a sharp raker claw dragging it from one end to the other. And with a sudden roar, the scraping in the boat, it seemed to be magnified. The hole took a jolt and the rock the frog to the side, a small jolt, then another large one, then a small one, and then a scraping grew fainter, and it was gone. Silence again. It happened so fast, he was so stunned that David had no time to react except to suck in half a breath and hold it in terror. He now rolled out of the boat, clean in his arm and head forgotten and scrambled through the rear hatch onto the deck. The boat rocked gently for a moment and then settled back into the stillness. There was no breeze and he couldn't see nothing floating in the water and the moonlight around her. Just silence. He climbed up on the cabin and held the mast and stepping to both sides and studying the surface of the water. Nothing, nothing showed. Nothing. Still he thought, still something had been there before. He hadn't dreamed it, or had he? He was in, in that time of sleep when the mind plays tricks just before deep sleep. Maybe that was it. Maybe it was some kind of dream or hallucination. People did that sometimes, hallucinated. He had been half asleep and had imagined the whole thing. That had to be it. He moved back slowly to the cockpit. There had been some scraping against the hull, surely. If it had been real, it would have left scratches in the side of the boat. Kneeling on the edge of the cockpit seat, he hung his in the lifeline with his right hand and leaned out so he was hanging over the boat about a foot and a half above the water and tried to peer down the side of the hole in the moonlight. Then the water beneath his face seemed to have a darkness of its own, a deep darkness, a whole world of darkness in the depth. At first, he could see nothing but the shine of the fiberglass and the dull light. Then he refocused his eyes and he squinted. There, a line. No, there were four or five of them scratches or gouges that went in for about three feet along the side of the boat, curving sideways and down into the water. It, it looked as if a giant claw had come out of the water and raked along the boat and then disappeared back into the sea. He hadn't dreamed it. And everything in him wanted to be a dream now that he saw those marks and that thought, that he hadn't dreamed about the sound and the lurching of the boat was almost his last. Out of the corner of his eye, just below him, David caught the faintest swirl of movement in the deep waters and shadows of the water. Later, he couldn't be sure if it were truly a shadow or the water itself, but whatever it was, he gave him a slight fraction of a second warning and he began to pull his head back. The water detonated surged up at his face in a sharp, gaping maw teeth flashing in the moonlight. Triangular, death, razor-sharp teeth blew up and out of the darkness, slashed past his face into the ripping sideways motion, and savagely raked down the side of the hole, slamming against the side of the boat so hard it knocked the frog sideways. Not over a second, and it was gone. Silence. David had thrown himself backwards into the cockpit and lay on his back with his head out of the other side of the boat over the water. He realized suddenly that he was exposed and he jerked it back to sit, wide-eyed in terror, staring at the cabin surface of the boat. Whoosh! The air whistled out of his lungs. 
He took another deep breath and without meaning to hold it for another half minute waiting, waiting for a sound, but there was none. He was shaking, his whole body trembling out of nowhere with no warning to explode that way and slash at him, or maybe not even him, but to close him and to come that way and attack the side of the boat while his head hung over the boat. Like bait, he thought. I was like bait. And to think I used to live and die with Owen. If it wanted me, truly wanted me, it could have came right into the cockpit, the shark. The shark. Just the word of it hit him. Shark. The mouth looked large enough to take his head off. Shark. When he thought of it coming out of the depths that way, coming out of the darkness like some evil, his breath came in tight little jerks, and he could only think of being taken, taken down, down, down into the blackness. He'd be snatched off the boat and taken down, down alone, completely alone in this world, down into the inky darkness. No, he thought, I have to stop this. What happened? Really? It's like Jaws. Not really a fish. A big fish with a lot of teeth, but a, but a fish just the same hit the side of the boat and I happened to be leaning over when it hit. I'm not, not even uh, been after me. It just happened to be leaning there. It could have been just hitting the boat. Wham! As if sensing his thoughts, the shark hit again, crashing against the side of the frog, pushing it sideways, ripping new fear through him. He almost screamed, but this time he controlled the fright faster and realized that He'd been right. It was hitting the boat. It went after him. And while he thought of the shark, hit it once more and again and again on the same side of the boat, but slightly forward. David went below into the cabin and felt the hole where the shark had hit and found there was no damage. While he was inside, it struck a sick time, still on the port, left side of the boat, just above the waterline, and he could feel the hole flex with the blow. It didn't make any sense. He'd always heard sharks were attracted to blood in the water, blood or meat or garbage, but there wasn't anything on the side of the boat to attract the shark. It was just clean, blue, white surface. Wait a minute. He studied the moon again. It was low and over the left side of the boat so that the right light reflected from the moon bounced off the left side of the hole and down into the water. From below, it must seem to be something flashing just above the surface water. And he had read that somewhere. No, he, he had heard talk of it at the main marine room, that sharks will sometimes hit flashing lights or movement because it's similar to a flash of a wounded fish when it rolls. Knowledge, he thought, even as the shark hit again is everything. As Owen had said, Owen had wanted to know all there was. Knowledge was for times like this, David thought, rolling with dark shark attacks. To have knowledge makes anything endurable. It's everything. The shark stayed near the boat for three or four more hours, hitting it more and more in frequent intervals until the moon was straight over the mast and no light reflected from the hull. Then the attacks completely stopped. And David went back to the captain's bunk to sleep the rest of the night without awakening until the morning sun baked inside the cabin. Chapter nine, bonus chapter. She was still an unholy mess. It looked as though someone had dumped a couple of garbage cans inside the cabin and the cushions were so wet, they still squished when he moved on them. His back and side were soaked from sleeping on sopping foam. His left arm so wet it had wrinkles in it as if he'd been stayed in the bathtub too long. He stood with his head out of the top of the cabin hatch and stretched. And he noted that his arm could reach higher than it had the day before. And he looked at the sky with the flat blue that stared down, the slate blue of the ocean, rolling still, slick and dead. Out at the horizon, it was impossible to see the line where the sea met the sky. And he felt once more as if he were in the bottom of a large blue bowl. No wind. No, he thought. Make that still. No wind. There was worse than bad taste in his mouth, as if all night there had been sucking on his He'd been sucking on his feet, he thought. He had no toothbrush. He turned automatically to the sink to get water to rinse his mouth, but thought better of it. Fresh water is precious. Too important to just spit out. Jammed up in the forward peak, there was a water 
there was water and wave action had taken it was a plastic bucket. He retrieved it, found some thin line tangled in the ball and untangled enough to cut the, the tie 10 feet to the handle of the bucket. He threw it over the side and pulled a bucket of seawater back into the cockpit. He couldn't help standing well back from the side, remembering the chart that we knew or felt sure that it had been striking the reflected moonlight. He shuddered, remembering the teeth breaking the side of the boat. In a small drawer near the floor under the sink, the only drawer that hadn't flown open and scattered its contents all over, he found a wash rag. The top side again, he stripped down and carefully bathed his whole body. The cockpit was a small well with two drain holes at the back. Not like a bathtub, and he washed and rinsed repeatedly, not unlike a bathtub. Filling the bottle, so, bo uh, bucket several times by throwing it over the side and holding it above his head to dump it like a shower. It was the first time he'd actually taken an inventory of himself, and he was amazed at the number of bruises. There were long, lateral, raking bruises down the sides of the grid. Blue-black lines that didn't hurt, but looked as if they should. Then more splotches of bruise on his hips and the insides of his legs. These ached dully. A well, welt bruise across his stomach. He washed carefully, the salt water stinging gently when he hit the scratch or a small cut. There seemed to be many of them as well as bruises. He wrenched the rag and dabbed at the cut on his head where the boom had taken him. The storm must have been even more violent than he imagined. It must have hammered and thrown him around inside the cabin when he was unconscious. There could be no other explanation for all the bruises and all the cuts. Salt in the wounds, salt water in the wounds was supposed to help them heal. Hurt, but heal. He had read that somewhere. Oh yes, now he knew. They used to whip men. He remembered the story suddenly. The British Navy used to tie men to the rail and flog them with a cat of nine tail, the whip made of nine leather strips, each with a small pellet of lead tied to the end. He'd read stories in one of Owen's sailing books just just for drinking too much fresh water, a man could be flogged with a cat of nine tails. Each time the whip struck, it would make cuts and lay the man's back bare, a vicious punishment from which men often died. But when they were whipped, some seamen, they had another man standing by the side with a bucket of salt water, which he would throw on the open whip wounds after each strike. Oh, David thought, squirming as the salt touched the small cuts and scratches on the sides of his arm. It must have been unbelievable. The pain from the salt water must have hurt worse than the whip. He finished bathing. Then he took another bucket full and washed the cockpit out. And there was, and there was hunger. It came with that speed. His mind was thinking of a sailor hanging on the rail with his back in ribbons and another man throwing salt water on his wound. And he dumped a bucket of water in the cockpit. And he was hungry. But now there was an awareness of it. This wasn't, wasn't the hunger he felt before, which had to be filled back right then, an emergency hunger. Now it was an ache, an emptiness that made him think as well as that. He found he could not separate his thoughts any longer. He was hungry, and that made him think of food, and how much food he had or didn't have, and that made him think of, of, of where he was, how far from land he was, how far from health he was, and that made him think of that there was still no wind to drive him. It didn't look like the wind was coming either. And that made him circle right back to hunger. So he wasn't just hungry. He was hungry with all his mind and body mixed in, hungry with the whole mix of his life caught in it. Which means I can't just eat, he said out loud. The other things have to be considered. I am hungry, he thought, but I'm hungry while I'm becalmed over 300 miles out to sea with no assistance available and one heck of a walk. If I want to hit a McDonald's, I'm hungry with limited food supply. And finally, I'm hungry, but I can't eat. There it is, he thought. There's the thought I was working for, but could not think. I'm hungry, and there's some food in the boat, some limited food, but I can't eat it. I must be very, very careful. That knowledge tore at him that there was food down in the boat, some cans of food, Cans of chili and fruit cocktails just lying on the floor where he'd been, where they'd been scattered by the storm, and he couldn't eat them. Today was the first time in his life that he had faced such a thing, and he knew 
also for the first time what it must be like to be poor, truly poor, and have hunger and not be able to do anything about it. Once he had seen a man in dirty clothes, uh, a street man dressed in the dirt of the street, walking down the aisle of a supermarket, an oxer wearing an old heel jacket, his eyes red and watering, his legs and his feet shuffling along as he stared, just stared at the rows and rows of food that he couldn't have, couldn't buy, couldn't eat. When he'd seen the man, David had been with his mother, and she had made some comment about a winery down on his luck, and David had agreed, but now he knew it for what it was. He was hungry. The man had wanted to eat, had been taken with hunger and the rows of food, but, they, but like David now, he couldn't eat it. It was then and now. It was then and was now a terrible thing. If David, David had been hungry and there was no food, he could have dealt with it more easily. But to be hungry and know there is food, no matter how little made the knowledge almost form, form of torture, kind of a testing, teasing torture. I could drink, he thought for a moment, and that would fill the emptiness and ease the hunger. But then he realized that he faced the same problem with water, fresh water. There was a tank built into the front end of the boat for fresh water, and he thought it held 20 gallons, but he didn't know how much water was in the tank. And as a matter of fact, even if it were full, 20 gallons of water was not very much when he was not just thirsty, but hungry and thirsty. And 300 miles out to sea with the wind and the belt. Not just thirsty, but thirsty with the thirsty with all the rest of his life. And that made him more thirsty, made his lips dry and his tongue stick to the roof of his mouth, all in seconds. He shook his head and wiped his face with his hands. Small droplets of seawater fell from his hair to the cockpit in the sea and he ran his hair through his hair once more to get the water out. He was insane. Nothing had changed really, but in a few seconds he'd gone from a normal healthy thinking to being ravage, ravishly hungry and thirsty to his tongue stuck with the roof of his mouth and his stubbing, stomach caving in towards his back home, all without reason. All he thought, it's all in my mind. Again, he shook his head. Well then, if, if he could think of, if he could think it, he could unthink it. If it was all in his mind, he could take it out of his mind. And he did in only a few seconds more, the feeling passed. He was still hungry and thirsty, but he was in control, and there was work to do. He pulled his shorts and jeans on, but left his t-shirt off and tied it to the handrail to air dry out, although he put his life jacket back on. On second thought, he took his pants off and tied them to the rail as well. They were musty and stinky, and he felt fresh now. And it wasn't as if there were a lot of people around to see him romping about in his underwear and life jacket. He had to finish putting the frog back together, and he had to take some kind of inventory and figure out just what he had or didn't have. And that's the end of chapter nine. Be on the lookout for chapter 10 and more, maybe later this week.